Today we're talking about being a powerful people of love. And yesterday, or yesterday, oh my goodness, last week, Pastor Mark talked about uh, God's powerful love for us. And today, this morning, I want to talk about our powerful love for God. You ever have a moment at night where you just can't go to sleep? Anyone just like, it, for me, it was last night. And you might be thinking like, man, God must have been speaking to him. God gave him a secret word at two in the morning that he wasn't going to share with anyone else. No, it's because I drank Vietnamese coffee at 730 last night. <laughs> but I will say, I committed that time to God. And I said, God, if, if there's something I should say, if you just so happen to speak in this moment, I will write it down. And I will share with the church tomorrow. Today, I don't necessarily want to preach. I just want to share something that's been in my heart for, I would probably count it about two years since we had our first Renaissance prayer conference in this room. Something that's been stirring inside of me. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, we're going to read verses 28 and 29. And this is going to kind of set the framework for our content today. Hebrews 28 or Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and let us offer to God acceptable worship. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Because we've been giving, given a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we ought to offer God what is acceptable with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. What I love about the Bible is when you read a verse, like in one book of the Bible, and the same verse is being proclaimed in another book of the Bible, it just helps kind of connect the dots for us and show that God had been working on the same thing over centuries. Like, none of this is new. And so you... Search back in the Old Testament. I know the Old Testament is often thought of as judgment and condemnation, but the Old Testament is full of grace and the Father's heart. Deuteronomy 4, where Moses told the Israelites, be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And so we see Moses in Deuteronomy saying the same thing that the author of Hebrews is saying thousands of years later in the New Testament. It's the same theme that's been recurring since the beginning of time. God calling out to his sons and daughters for a love and an affection that's worthy and acceptable to him. Verse 23 in Deuteronomy 4, basically, Moses is saying, Hey, Israelites, you ought to choose God as the singular object of your affection. Because in that time, it was common for towns and people groups to build up idols and to worship idols. And so Moses is reminding the Israelites, choose God as the singular object of your affection. Be careful not to give glory to someone who doesn't deserve it. And then verse 24, for our God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now, I know sometimes it gets confusing. What does a consuming fire mean? Is God really talking about like a burning fire? Like, is it really? Can we study the Hebrew and the Greek? And can we look through the text and make sure that our interpretation of consuming fire is correct? And I did the study. And it literally means a consuming fire. <laughs> That's what it means. Deuteronomy 7 tells us that when they would set up these idols, that God would literally burn all of these wooden statues and figures that they had created because the glory didn't belong to them. The glory belonged to God. And so God is telling the Israelites, he's telling us today, he's telling, he's telling his sons and daughters in the book of Hebrews that our attention and our affection and our worship and our love belongs to him and him alone. 
We're coming up on wedding season. Right? I've heard. Any photographers in the house? Anyone shoot weddings? Shooting weddings is really hard. It's, it's really hard because it's just long. You ever been to a wedding that's just forever? And like really the only thing that matters is they say, I do, which takes two seconds, but it's like two days long. <laughs> I used to shoot weddings a lot, photography. My favorite part of the wedding, maybe you guys can relate to this. My favorite part of the wedding is when the groom is standing at the altar and they start playing the music and the doors open in the back and the bride starts walking in. Right? Experienced photographers know this. You don't pay attention to the bride walking in. You pay attention to the groom's response. You watch the groom as he stands in anticipation for his bride to come down the aisle. There's a verse in Ezekiel 16 that talks about this. And this is going to feel very um, not as joyful, but we're going to connect the dots for you this morning. Ezekiel 16, 32. It's not in the notes, but you can write this down. It's when God is speaking to Israel, and he calls Israel an adulterous wife and says, you prefer strangers to your own husband. And then in Ezekiel 16, 35, he says, therefore, you prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. Here's, here's the image. This is the image of a wedding, because much of what the gospel tells us is about a covenant between God and his sons and his daughters, the bride of Christ and the bridegroom. Here's the image. God is standing at the altar, the bridegroom, waiting for his bride to come down the altar. The music starts playing. Everyone stands up. The doors swing open. And in come God's bride, but also work. Also attached to work is the idol of our family and our affection that we give to everyone else. And attached to that is finances. And attached to that is relationships. And attached to that are all of these other things that we've placed above God as the object of our affection. Here's the imagery that the bridegroom is waiting for his bride to return. And in comes everything else that we place above him. See, what the Bible indicates throughout the whole story is that love and worship and honor is designated for God and him alone. And that there's an acceptable form of worship that he ought to receive. And as we talk about powerful love for God, we ought to uncover what the gospel says about acceptable worship. I want to know, God, what then is acceptable to you? If we're saying that this kingdom requires acceptable worship to you, what is acceptable worship or love even look like? If you're taking notes this morning, you can write this down. Powerful love for God is love that responds to God. Not love that hopes to get a response from God. See, order is important. Order is important because it shows our priority. Powerful love for God actually comes as a response of me seeing my Savior. And it elicits a movement or an action in my heart. And I'm able to love God. What's tempting is that we can come in on a Sunday morning and we think our action and a response elicits a response from God. But powerful love for God comes straight from our ability to see him rightly. Like, I want you to know how much God loves you. John 15, 9, maybe you've read the story. Jesus washes his disciples' feet and then predicts his betrayal and then says this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. The same way that God loves Jesus is the same way that God loves you. God 
God loves sinless, blameless, blameless, without fault Jesus the same way that he loves you right now as you sit in that seat in San Francisco on Sunday morning. God loves you the same exact way. I want you to do this. Turn to your neighbor this morning. Go ahead, turn to him. Say, God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Now, I want you to say this to yourself. Anyone ever, like, talk to themselves? I got to give myself pep talks sometimes. Come on. Can we normalize that it's okay that sometimes we've got to talk to ourselves? Church online, I know you do it too. Talk to yourself this morning. Tell yourself, self. <laughs> Don't say that. Say your name. Say your name. <laughs> self. If that's your name, you say that. But say your name. Say, God loves me the same way he loves Jesus. I want you to say it again. Instead of saying me, say your first name. God loves Austin the same way he loves Jesus. I have a hard time with this. I tend to lean more towards the uncertainty and the challenge to actually believe it. Like right now, can you sit where you are with 100% honesty and say, I believe that God loves me the same exact way he loves Jesus all the time? You don't have to answer. This is just for you to consider. Because I think if we were able to accept the fact that God loves us like that, I think our love for him would look a lot different. I think our response to the Father would sound a lot different. Not that John 3, 6, and I know, you know, we've been to church, we've been to Sunday school, anyone went to Royal Rangers when they were kids, anyone got Bible bucks, anyone earned Bible bucks in Sunday school for bringing a friend to, to church, anyone get a Bible book for knowing the motions to, um, Lord, I lift your name on high, Lord, I, can anyone do it here? I will give you a Bible buck, I'll find one. If you can do it for church online, right now, you will get a mansion in heaven. <laughs> Listen, like, like, I know we've been in church before, and I know in general, theoretically, we understand the concept that God loves us. Here's the difference. A lot of us understand the John 3.16 love, that God so loved the world, but a lot of us have a hard time accepting that God loves me. We're okay with this general sense that God loves the world, but Jesus, are you sure as the Father has loved you, he loves me? Are you sure? Like, I, are you sure? Here's the, here's the tension that I've found. We can come and gather on a place like this on a Sunday morning, and it's easy to be tempted to think, that our actions bring credibility to our love for God. Let me say it like this. Have you ever walked in on a Sunday morning and you're singing the songs, but deep down inside you're like, look, God, look at how I'm singing to you. I told you I love you. Like, look, God, look at this finesse when I wave my wrist at the new people who come in. Look at that, God. I love you. Look at that. Like, it's easy to come in and think like, hey, God, check out this smile. I'm on the hospitality team. I love you. I told you, God. I told you I love you. Or like, God, look, I automated my tithes and offerings. Doesn't this prove that I love you? God, I showed up on Sunday, on time. I really love you. Or God, look at me. I clapped during worship, and I clapped on beat. Like, obviously, God, I love you. 
And what happens if we don't understand that our love for God comes out of a response to God's love for us, we can create this me-centered worship where all we're doing is try to win over the approval of God by our actions. And now my love for God and my worship for God isn't actually based on his character, but it's based on my ability to lift my hands. And it's based on my ability to show up. And it's based on my ability to sing a song. And if we want to be people of powerful love for God, we have to confront this consumerist Christianity that tells us that the more that I do, the more God knows that I love him. Because loving God for the sake of loving God is such a beautiful thing. Loving God because we see the beauty of our king and because we come under this holy humility that says, I don't deserve this and yet you've done it is such a beautiful thing. This morning as I was driving in, and maybe this is why it makes sense now, this morning, I'm driving in from the North Bay, and I just kept hearing this purity of worship, purity of worship, purity of worship. And I just feel like right now, God just helped me connect the dots to share with you that there is a purity in worship that belongs to the Father, and he deserves nothing less than pure worship that is focused on his character and his holiness. To know that what I do doesn't change who he is. But what I do is in response of seeing the entirety of the Father's heart. There's a purity in worship. What's acceptable worship to God? It's worship that comes from a pure place. This April, my wife and I are going to be celebrating 10 years of marriage. The Lord has given her great endurance. Yes. Yes. But one thing that I've learned through marriage, and, you know, those who've been married longer than I can probably attest to this, is when you get married, your I do is saying, I'm going to love this person to the fullest capacity based on what I know about you right now. Let me me help unpack this, because this is going to be helpful. We say, I do at the altar based on what we know to be true right now in this moment about our spouse. But that doesn't mean that that's all that we're going to love them with. It's just in this moment that I say I do, I'm basing it on what I know about you right now. But what I found is that the more time I spend with my wife, I start learning new things. I start seeing new little quirks. My wife, when she laughs, she'll watch this online and she'll love it. (laughs) Sometimes when she laughs, usually at my stupid dad jokes, um, she kind of drools when she laughs. And I love it. (laughs) The more you discover about your spouse, right? (laughs) I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to repeat what he said. There will be no record of that. (laughs) The more you discover about your spouse, the more you love them. And when you say, I do, it's not like, it's not this is the most that I can ever love you. It's just that this is the most I can love you right now based on what I know to be true about you in this moment. And the more you learn about them, the more you love them. Like the more you discover about God the more you love him. Like when we say I do to Jesus, we say, yes, come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. We're saying I love you as much as I can according to what I know today to be true about you. But that doesn't mean that's all that I'm going to give you because I'm going to go through seasons of my life where I start uncovering more about the depth of the Father's heart for me and I'm going to fall more in love with him. The more you uncover and discover about God, the more you will fall in love with him. It's this idea of salvation in Ephesians. 
when Paul tells this, the church of Ephesus to work out your salvation, it's the word kater godsamai. And it's this idea that there's more to salvation than we first received. Almost like salvation is a discovery or a journey of layers that we uncover. It's kind of like this, like when I was growing up, we grew up, we grew up poor. Anyone like food stamps poor when they were still like in a booklet? Like not when they were fancy on a plastic debit card so you felt fancy, but like they were actual food stamps in a booklet. And I remember <laughs> we were so broke. My mom is crazy for this. We would get ketchup. Kata God to my uncovering all the layers of salvation, discovering all of the layers of the Father's heart, we would get ketchup, and we would be done with a bottle of ketchup, and I'd go to throw it away. And my mom would say, boy, what are you doing? I said, mom, I'm throwing away the ketchup bottle. It's all gone. She said, no, it's not. Open that thing up and pour some water in it. Shake that bottle up. We got more ketchup. <laughs> Carter God to my, there's more that we've yet to uncover. It's kind of like my wife we're, um, we're an Aveeno family. Anyone use Aveeno lotion? That's us. We're an Aveeno family. It's the Lord's lotion. So, <laughs> when we first got married, this is all the stuff you learn about your spouse. This is the best, <laughs> the best part of marriage. I went to go throw away this bottle of Aveeno because I wasn't getting anything out. Like I was hitting the pump, and it wasn't pumping anything. So I said, we're out. I got to go throw it away. My wife said, what are you doing? I said, I'm throwing away the bottle of lotion. We got to go back to Costco and get the value pack so we don't run into this problem so fast. She says, no, 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 no. Give me that bottle. She takes the bottle. <laughs> oh, she's going to love the live stream. She takes the bottle. She gets scissors. She cuts the bottle open. And by God, at the bottom of this bottle of lotion, there is a ton more that that little pump was not reaching. Carter God's in mind, there is more layers and depths to the Father's heart that you have yet to uncover. You think that your love for God is going to be powerful because you know how to sing a song. Your love for God is powerful when you start uncovering the depths of the Father's heart for you. Oh, there's more, because my wife is frugal. So after the lotion story, <laughs> I'm brushing my teeth one day, and we've got this tube of Colgate on the counter, and it's done. It's empty. I go to throw away the toothpaste. My wife says, what are you doing? I said, I'm throwing away the toothpaste. We got to go back to Costco, get a value pack so we don't have to come back and do this again. She says, give me that toothpaste. She grabs the tube. Hold on. You guys have never heard of this. You've never heard of this. She grabs a tube of toothpaste. She goes into her desk. She gets a binder clip. Hold on. She rolls the tube of toothpaste as if to get all of that toothpaste from the end to the front and then clips it with the binder clip so it can't go back. <laughs> Cotter God's am I. There are more layers and depths of the Father's heart that you have yet to uncover. And if you would, go through this journey with God to know that the more I uncover about him, the more I'm going to fall in love with him. Jonathan Butler Kirk Whalen back in the day used to sing this song. If you know it, you can sing it with me. Falling in love with Jesus. I see you singing, girl. Don't stop. Come on. <laughs> Falling in love with Jesus. I can't do the falsetto. Okay, is he crazy? Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done. When you go on this journey to understand the heart of the Father for you, your love for the Father will grow. It'll grow so much that you, you ever read stories of like revivalists who do all these crazy things for the kingdom of God and you're like, what? They did what? Last month, we celebrated Black History Month and a pastor from across the country made this post and so I want to share with you what it looks like. 
when you allow God to capture your heart and so respond in a way to say, God, is this acceptable worship to you? I think we have the images that will go up. Elder Lucy Smith, the founder of All, Night, All Nations Pentecostal Church in Chicago, made history as the first black woman to lead any major congregation in the area. She would hold healing services three times a week where the deaf, blind, crippled, lame, stroke victims, and those with cancer were healed weekly. When you allow God to capture your heart and respond in a way that says, God, I hope this is acceptable to you, you end up doing things that thousands, hundreds of years later we look at and we say, wow. William Seymour, who passed in 1922, one of the most influential men in birthing the modern Pentecostal movement. The leadership over the Azusa Street Revival sparked the growth of a global reawakening to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, as well as a large ministry sending movement, Azusa Street Revival, because he allowed God to capture his heart. And so respond in a way that said, God, I hope my worship is acceptable to you. We're not done. William Duma, South African Baptist preacher, known for his healing and prayer ministry, touched parts of Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, no, yep, Zimbabwe, Zambia, known to spend whole nights in prayer in preparation for ministry. And it was said that when he returned, his face would glow supernaturally. Listen, if you want powerful love for God, you ought to position yourself in a place, number one, to allow God to capture your heart, and number two, that you can see our Savior in all of his splendor and all of his glory, and then respond as to say, God, I pray this worship is acceptable to you. At Experience Church, we do this thing called Selah Questions, and we're going to pause here for a moment because I need to catch my breath. The Selah question for today that we're going to discuss with those around us is this. When you look at God, what characteristic makes you fall more in love with him? Go ahead and take two minutes to discuss this with those around you. I don't mind if you guys talk. What are some of the characteristics that you guys shared with each other? Things that make you fall more in love with God. He's gentle. Oh, I love that. His kindness. Y'all are talking over each other. Hold on. <laughs> Persistent. Loving. His faithfulness. <sighs> He's gracious. His power. Well, I heard it. Forgiving? Forgiving. Yes. 
the more we see God rightly, the more we fall in love with him. The more he shows us the depths of his heart and his love for us. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up already. Ephesians 3, as Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus, he says this. This is kind of our last point that's going to frame how we respond to God. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Here's what I need you to understand today is we can't actually love God by ourselves. We actually need God to strengthen our inner person, our inner spirit being, our inner man. In order to even have the capacity to fathom how much he loves us and so respond in a way that says, God, we love you. Listen, I love, I love singing to God. I love raising my hands as a sign of surrender. I love shouting. If there was more room in here, I would run. I would jump. I love it all. But none of that, none of it, none of it is love for God if it's not motivated or inspired by our image of God. See, I can come in and clap my hands and I can do it without loving God. I can come in and I can sing the songs and I can do it without loving God. But I can also come in Look upon our Savior. Be so moved by his beauty that it causes me to respond. Order is important because it shows where our precedence and our priority is. We cannot love God apart from him. We actually need him to help us to love him. This morning, we're going to respond. And we're going to respond in a couple of different ways. I do want to say this. If you're here this morning and, I, like, I get it. Sometimes we come into church and we just got stuff that we've been dealing with all week. Like, we got junk that we come in with. And it begs the question, like, Austin, okay, you're telling me that God loves me that much and I should offer something acceptable to him. But how do I love God in the midst of unanswered prayer? How do I have powerful love for God when he feels distant? How do I have powerful love for God when I'm facing a potential layoff? How can I love God radically when my kids say something hurtful to me? How can I love God when I've had a rift in my marriage? How can I love God? What do you want me to do? There's a couple of ways that I've found that help us discover, right? Because our ability to love God is actually found in our discovering of his heart for us and our exploring through the depths and the layers of his love. And it's through a couple of things. Number one is through prayer, right? We pray, God, would you help me? Would you give me strength on the inside to be able to love you through this? Not apart from it, but through what I'm going through in my life, God, can you help me to love you? The second thing is through this. While this is, yes, a historical document, this is more importantly a love letter from a God who longs to be, a father who longs to be with his sons and daughters. You start flipping through these pages, you're going to discover the Father's heart for you. The third is through meditation. You find a promise in here and you sit and you meditate with that thing. You wrestle with that promise from God. You ask God questions. The Bible says that David inquired of the Lord. You inquire of God. God, with this promise, how do I balance this promise with what I'm going through right now? God, how do I balance the faithfulness of God with what feels like distance? You do it through fellowship. You show up. You get around people who have seen God and who can share stories and testimonies of his faithfulness and his love for you. And the last way you can experience and discover God is through silence. And so I'm gonna ask that you stand with me this morning.
And usually we would get to this place in our worship experience where we would say, let's respond to God through song. But I'm going to challenge us today. So as to not make our actions the focal point of our worship to God, I'm going to ask that we stand in complete silence. Even the band, the keys, you can come down, guitar, everything. Just complete silence in this room. So as to make our worship focused on God and God alone. We're going to spend 30 seconds in silence in the presence of God. seconds of silence. What did you feel? You can say it from where you are. Personally, I just felt like, you know, that like sigh of relief, like <sighs> anyone else feel anything different? Peace stillness you felt the father's love in silence and in that 30 seconds of silence God never felt less faithful to me in that 30 seconds of silence it never felt like God loved me less it never felt like he went away it never felt like he was upset with me. It never felt like he forgot about me. Still felt the same way. He is holy, apart from anything I can say or do. So we're going to do it again. And this time I'm going to ask you that you would lift your hands to heaven as a sign of surrender for 30 seconds of complete silence. seconds of silence with my hands raised with no music and no singing just felt such a weightiness of God's presence God is holy and deserving of our love apart from anything we can sing apart from any song that we play apart from any action or deed he is and he deserves worship that is acceptable to him. And so, Austin, does that mean during this last song of worship, we're not going to sing? What do we do then? We respond. But it's important for us to know and to come to this place where we can give God worship that's acceptable to him apart from a worship team apart from musicians, apart, like, David didn't have Frank and Jared and, what was your name? Keith and Bella and Sky and Joy. David didn't have all of them following him along. He had musicians, but he didn't have them. Like, Abraham didn't have a 24-7 full-time guitar player that would follow him along and sing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. He was able to worship God apart 
from it all. And so here's what I'm asking you today, church. Would you worship God? Not in the hopes of getting a feeling or an emotion, but would we respond to God for the sake of responding to his holiness? Would we lift up worship that's acceptable to him? Not because it might get us something, but because he deserves it all. That he alone is worthy of all glory and all praise, and he deserves all of our affection. And so as we respond this morning, I'm just going to invite you, if you want to pray with us in the back, I'd love to pray with you. But let's respond and give God worship that's acceptable to him.